So hello and welcome to another chat on military history not visualized. Uh, joining me today is Austin Arachi. Austin runs a growing internet archive on Japanese naval landing forces and has re uh, recently written a book on the same subject entitled Riku Sentai, the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Japanese Naval Landing Forces 1927-1945. Uh, it's therefore not surprising that we've invited him here today to talk a bit more about uh, the Japanese Naval Landing Forces. Uh, so welcome, Austin. And would you like to add uh, anything more about yourself before we dive in? Hi, sure. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm from Vancouver Island, Canada. I'm 22 years old. I spent a little bit of time living in Nagoya and have studied a lot of Japanese while living there. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and I, I envy your Japanese skills, by the way. Yeah, it's certainly a lot of work. So I guess uh, just diving into the questions now. So I guess we'll start uh, right from the beginning. When did the Imperial Navy form naval landing forces and why? So it kind of starts right back in 1871. And um, the Navy opened what was called the Naval Officer School. Beginning in 1871, the Japanese Navy actually formed a Marine Corps. And they actually used the term Marine in English in the beginning. Now, these were heavily influenced from the British Marines. And these Marine troops were placed on ships in relation to their crew size and were trained as either infantrymen or artillery troops. They saw their first action in 1874 in the Saga Rebellion to help the army. And in the same year, they were sent on expedition to Taiwan. The Navy was undergoing a lot of reformations during this period, and by 1876, they were already disbanded. Replacing them were the Naval Landing Forces. The Naval Landing Forces were a much more flexible system that had all sailors trained as naval infantry, so any ship could simply raise its crew as, as an ad hoc infantry formation, offering much better flexibility than dedicated Marines. Does that mean that it's technically incorrect to refer to naval landing forces as Japanese Marines, as is commonly done in English? Well, given that the Japanese Navy actually did have Marines for a short period of time, it is a little confusing to call them by Marines when they're a somewhat different successor. And in the English speaking world, I see a lot of the time we kind of consider Marines to be a distinct branch of the Navy or even independent of it, which the naval landing forces never existed as. But on the other hand, there's many period English references even those published by the Japanese government that do refer to the naval landing forces as Marines. And also some other nations, for example, Italy, I think would be an example. They don't have an exclusive branch for their naval infantry and they form their units with sailors, but nonetheless, they do call them Marines. So the Japanese Navy is kind of comparable with this system. Overall, I think it's best to call them naval infantry, but I don't really take offense if someone's going to call them Marines. We've brushed up against this a little bit, but what were the differences between what we think of as Marines in the English speaking world, like, you know, Royal Marines, US uh, uh, MC versus the Naval Landing Forces? Like what were the Naval Landing Forces at this early stage, kind of the 19th century into the early 20th? Okay. So I guess, you know, with the Royal Marines and US Marines, we can see that they're distinct branches and they have their own ranks. But in contrast, uh, when Naval Landing Forces were first formed and basically throughout their entire existence, they were never recognized as a distinct branch and they never had their own ranks. So that's one part that certainly separates them. Another thing is generally when we think of Marines, they have some long-standing units, but with the Japanese Navy, up until really the 1930s, almost all Naval Landing Force units were just existing on a temporary basis. In the early days, Naval Landing Forces were mostly just light infantry. So they relied heavily on their commanding fleets for a steady stream of resupplying. Therefore, they weren't really capable of long-term expeditions or engagements that we see with U.S. Marines or Royal Marines. But nonetheless, we do see a big overlap with what they did. I mean, they're both kind of the Naval's ground combat force, and they're also like guarding foreign settlements abroad, which we see U.S. Marines doing a lot as well. Even in the mid-1920s, the Japanese Navy actually was doing a study, and they had Ota Minoru comparing the U.S. Marines in Shanghai with their organization and equipment to what they had with their own Naval Landing Forces in Shanghai. As we kind of expand with the Naval Landing Forces and they get larger and more specialized, it's hard to really view them as that same temporary Naval Landing Forces organization. It becomes much more comparable to Marines as they're really deliberately organized for specific missions and very well armed compared to just ad hoc Naval Infantry. U.S. intelligence really didn't agree with the comparisons of Japanese Naval Landing Forces to Marines. They actually, in one bulletin released in October 6, 1944, said, Naval ground personnel are not, or at any rate, no longer picked troops. They're just ordinary sailors and engine room hands picked at random from the receiving barracks at naval stations and formed into these units as needed. 
there is no such thing as Imperial Marines. So they were obviously quite dismissive of the comparison. And we do see, uh, looking at rosters of units, for example, the Gray 3rd Special Naval Landing Force in 1942, it really does support the American viewpoint. This unit had over 90% reservists, and for every squad of 11 or so men, only one man had participated in more than basic infantry training. So they are quite low quality troops, as the U.S. said, and not really Marines. And uh, it could be said that the low quality troops are representative of naval landing forces since their earliest days, as the Navy regarded them more as like a, as an unfortunate necessity than something they really were uh, allocating budget to. And they generally didn't put the best troops in these units. Navy officers also, especially the infantry ones, never really considered themselves as Marines. For example, uh, Yamabe Masao, who was a paratrooper and then commanded a raider unit. In his memoirs, he never drew any comparisons to that. And uh, you can't really find any examples of naval officers comparing it. It's more a contemporary thing that we see nowadays. Nonetheless, there is a lot of similar duties that they shared, and uh, some of the organization is similar. But overall, I think with the quality and how these units mostly existed just in wartime, it's a pretty strong argument that they don't really belong in the same category as other famous examples of Marines. Um, so I guess we've kind of mentioned that these were essentially armed sailors, at least particularly the NLFs early on. Um, how much infantry t- training did sailors receive? And did they have any refresher training on uh, infantry tactics and, and weapons use as part of their kind of broader training as sailors? So ideally, all sailors would have about six months of training at uh, naval bases, Kai Heidan, which means naval corps. And this training, it concluded like everything that a sailor needed to know. So basic vessel maneuvering, signaling, cleaning the vessel, and also part of it was infantry training. So a small portion of the six months would include some infantry practice. Now, with the Second Sino-Japanese War and then the Pacific War, this training got drastically shortened, sometimes like less than half of the six months. So their infantry training really only encompasses a small portion of that. Some sailors did progress to what was called the Naval Gunnery School. There was one in Yokosuka and another one in Tatayama. And these offered specialized weapons training courses for things like anti-aircraft guns or artillery, uh, even some tanks. And uh, these courses were around, again, six months or so, depending on the level. So there was a small minority of sailors that would have better training than that. Now, in terms of refreshers, usually the only real refreshers they'd be getting would be like some public demonstrations or parades where they're organized into a naval landing force. Some admirals of fleets put in more effort to making sure their men were well-trained and they'd get the men on the ground for a certain part of the year to do a big combined naval landing force training drill. But overall, they usually didn't get a lot of good training. So when an operational need to form a naval landing force was identified, how were the sailors picked from um, ships to form the naval landing force? On any vessel, sailors from the seamen or line branch would make up the majority of the crew. So they would generally be the first choice for the enlisted men and petty officers. Now, if there was not enough of the seamen available, the rest would be made up with uh, engineers, basically serving the exact same role. They weren't like combat air engineers or anything. They just would do the exact same role as regular infantry. Uh, The deployments had levels of 15%, 25%, and 30 to 35% roughly. Uh, There wasn't really like a definite rule of how they chose the men, but they tried to not rid the ship of those that were valuable, which kind of becomes difficult because the best sailors for naval infantry are those trained in naval gunnery, but they also need those to man the ship guns. So it it definitely became kind of difficult, you know, for those higher deployments where they're using like one third of the crew. For officers, it was always those with gunnery training that would be the first to go and land as they really knew how to maneuver infantrymen. Running into kind of their f- earliest uh, combat experience, uh, what did the naval landing forces do in, say, the first Sino-Japanese War, Russo-Japanese War, um, possibly even a Siberian intervention, though I can't remember if they were ever even deployed there, uh, First World War, etc. Sure. So they did see action in the first Sino-Japanese War, and they're mostly just helping the army. So they were using fairly small units at the time, companies or at max battalion size, and they were capturing strategic islands, ports, and coastal batteries, and also reinforcing areas when there wasn't enough army troops there. And then moving on to the Russo-Japanese War, they got quite a bit bigger at this point, and we started to actually see a few special naval landing forces as well, and brigade size movements. We also saw what were called naval landing force heavy artillery units, which, uh, were units that used large naval guns like 15 centimeter, 12 centimeter, 
on the ground. And uh, these units participated in the siege of Port Arthur and were helping the army bombard the city to capture it. I guess then we can move forward to the First World War. Um, again, they worked with the army to siege Singtao and had a heavy artillery unit there as well. And then there was some special naval landing forces sent down to the South Pacific to capture the German possessions. They also were in the Siberian intervention, but they weren't really playing a, you know, the army had a really ambitious role there, but the Navy was mostly just helping, uh, you know, help the civilians that were Japanese get sent back home to safety and guarding some areas as well. What would you say, like, how, how are they performing in these various wars? Was there like a, a difference in the kind of their level of performance between the first Sino-Japanese war and the Russo-Japanese war, for example? Um, or do they just kind of tend to do a reasonable job throughout? They did okay, but they were, the movements were so small compared to the army. They kind of, they really took like the, the back seat in them. So they're not, they're not super remembered, but you do start to see like, uh, around Tsingtao, they started using naval gunnery school troops, which had better training. So I guess kind of around the First World War or sometime in the Russo-Japanese War, you start to see the units with better training and combat performance. What were their peacetime duties, if they had any? Well, naval landing forces were usually kind of raised in times of need. So during peacetime, there wasn't much at all. There was kind of the troops at the bases being trained. And then there was like very small garrisons in the Pacific and some other areas, but they really were pretty much non-existent in peacetime. We've already been mentioning a little bit uh, naval landing forces versus special naval landing forces. Um, relatively speaking, the latter, the special naval landing forces or SNLF are better known in English. Uh, what were they, uh, why were they formed and what made them special? Okay, so special naval landing force basically is just a naval landing force that is independent of a ship crew. Instead, it's formed at a naval base. And the idea behind this is that you can form a much larger unit without putting a big strain on the ship's crew and, you know, having it operate at much lower capacity and combat. Now, we first kind of see these in 1900. There was one formed at Sasebo Naval District and sent to uh, the High River in China during the Boxer Rebellion. And it was there to capture the Taku forts and protect civilians. The units are generally about a battalion in size. And originally they had about two companies. As they went on, they would have three or maybe even as far as like 10 companies in some really odd cases. Now the practice was pretty much just a de facto policy in the Navy. It wasn't actually recognized up until 1932. So there's not a lot of like official documentation of how they were organized. They were generally just organized for a specific mission in mind and then disbanded afterwards. So I guess skipping forward at least a little bit to a very uh, large scale engagement, actually, that heavily involved naval forces, and that was the 1932 Battle of Shanghai. So what was kind of the combat role of the naval landing forces in that action um, in 1932? Sure. So from the outbreak, they were basically the only troops on the ground other than there was about a company of Japanese troops in the Shanghai Volunteer Corps and some civilians. So for the first week or so until February 7th, when the army could actually relieve them a bit, these were the main defenders in the area. Now, the actual naval landing force in Shanghai had been there since 1927 and was commanded by the 1st Expeditionary Fleet. Originally, it was a very big unit. It was a brigade and it had about eight battalions, but by early 1932, it only had one battalion and then was quickly reinforced with two extra battalions right before the incident. Now, during the incident, four more battalions arrived, and there was also ship crews that relieved them on the ground as well. And the unit had a few special weapons units like artillery and an armored car company. Uh, their, fa their fighting was mostly around uh, the edge of the international settlement, pushing into Chinese area. They heavily contested the Shanghai Nanking Railway and were fighting a lot in Chape. Um, the first battalion, which had been there for quite a while, it performed quite well and was really well armed, but the other battalions, since they were relatively new and undertrained, a lot of them had a tough time in the battle. Actually, uh, the commander of the unit, Captain Tomoshige Samajima, which you might know because he commanded the 8th Fleet in World War II, he said that they had pretty much no weapons and not even enough helmets for their men, and it was a battle they faced with extreme difficulties. So... It was pretty disastrous overall, but thanks to the army arriving, they did manage to eventually push the 
Chinese forces out of the city and get a ceasefire signed. How kind of well established were the naval landing forces by 1932? Because a lot of the images I've seen of the of their the Navy's headquarters in Shanghai are usually later, and it looks pretty robust. Um, it's a very imposing building. Um, usually they're uh, fo- shots of like things like armored cars or something rolling out of them. Is that something that comes after 1932, or are they pretty well established going into the 1932 battle? That's a great question. So actually that building, before the... Before 1933, there was a headquarters on that site, but it was much smaller and it wasn't as reinforced. And it was more like a traditional building and it got hit quite hard because it wasn't a well-armored building. And um, during the actual battle, the battalion spread out to different areas as well. That was kind of their main base at that building, but then they set up shop in Japanese schools, businesses, factories, and other areas. It's kind of, you know, to stage their forward defenses. What noteworthy organizational changes occurred to the SNLF um, kind of from their creation through to 1941? Because it seems like, um, at least from reading your book, that there's quite a, there's some important um, changes that occur to some SNLF uh, through this period. Certainly, there was a lot of changes. So originally, like the first unit we saw in the Boxer Rebellion, it was a battalion-sized unit. And these units usually had a headquarters section two or more rifle companies and attached support units like communications, medical, construction, supply, etc. Now, in the Meiji era, it was basically just riflemen and then a bit of artillery. In the Taisho era, we begin to see some heavy machine guns incorporated into the organization. Now, in the late Taisho era, we can start to see kind of the beginnings of the standardized platoon. So we'll see roughly 30 to 50 men divided into four squads, and then they'll have one or two heavy machine guns, and then the rest will be riflemen and some men with pistols. Now, in the early Showa era, they adopted the Type 11 light machine gun, which really started to change the tactical organization. So then they started to make dedicated heavy machine gun platoons, and then the rest of the rifle platoons would have light machine guns. Now they would take about two to four of these rifle platoons and then a heavy machine gun platoon, plus a command platoon to make a company, and then duplicate a company along with the support units and headquarters to make a battalion. In 1936, they actually finally published the first standardized organization, which was pretty similar to what we started to see in the Showa era in the beginning. So it was four rifle platoons, command platoon, and machine gun platoon for a total of 210 men per company, and then attached communications, construction, reserve ammo, medical, and supply units in the headquarters which made a unit with a total of 539 men. Uh, Moving towards December of 1937, they then passed a decree for combined Special Navy Landing Force headquarters, which allowed them to combine um, two or more of these units into a brigade-sized unit. Uh, We saw use of them in China and then to an extent in the Pacific. So as we go through the 1930s, it becomes really difficult to speak in a general sense for how the units were organized because they became increasingly more specialized. You'd rarely see units with the same you know, organization between the two. They usually now had more than two companies and usually at least one of the companies was a special weapons sort of unit that had artillery or tanks or mortars or some other specialized weapon. In 1941, the units were all much larger than 539 men, usually double in size. There were some even at 1600 men by then. And they usually had a special weapons unit with anti-aircraft, mountain guns, dual purpose guns, or something else. And the squads also had started to grow a lot larger. They were usually 11 enlisted men per petty officer. So we can kind of see the units are getting, they're growing in size, but the number of officers and petty officers is not really growing relative to them. So the command is starting to suffer from it. Um, So what combat roles did the Naval Landing Forces undertake in the Second Sino-Japanese War up to uh, 1941? The first action began with the Battle of Shanghai in late summer of 1937. Now, there was already the Shanghai Special Navy Landing Force that had been garrisoned there permanently after the 1932 incident concluded. And a bunch of additional battalions came to defend them as well. And then the Japanese army showed up again and saved the day. They did win in Shanghai, but it was somewhat costly. And some of these naval landing forces were then sent with the army to other areas across the coast of China to help blockade China from their allies. In general, they were focused on the coastal and riverine operations and their army counterparts uh, kind of directed their power into focusing on inland operations. The first thing to happen after they won in Shanghai 
was moving towards Tsingtao in early 1938, which they captured, then Amoy, Hankou, and then Canton all in the same year. Then in the following year, in early 1939, a few special naval landing forces and some other naval landing force units called uh, Bobitai, which were defense units. They were pretty similar, but they had some uh, seafaring elements to them as well. Joined up with the army and captured Hainan Island. And that was basically the last major offensive for naval landing forces in China. From then on, the focus was mostly just cleaning up the captured areas and uh, focusing on kind of building them up for fleet and air facilities. Where do naval paratroopers and raider units fit into the SNLF? This is like chronologically, we're maybe a little bit early here, but um, obviously naval paratroopers would actually have a role in the initial move south and then raider units would come in later. Um, so kind of where does it fit in with this this organization? Right. Okay. So the Japanese Navy began a trial program of airborne operations in late 1940. And then in 1941, they really ramped it up. They opened up a new training area called Tatayama Naval Gunnery School. And they were focusing on making a big paratrooper unit called the Yokosuka 1st Special Naval Landing Force. The one unit was then split to make the Yokosuka 3rd Special Naval Landing Force as well. And these two units had really good troops compared to other units. There was no conscripts or reservists. These were all volunteers and went through really rigorous training. Although... Overall, their training was kind of short compared to uh, Army counterparts. So the Yokosuka 1st Special Naval Landing Force did their first combat jump in January of 1942, landing on Monado Airfield, which was fairly successful. And then the Yokosuka 3rd Special Naval Landing Force conducted a drop in the following month on Timor, but they ran into a lot of trouble. They didn't drop directly on the airfield because they wanted to avoid casualties, but then they ran into enemy forces in the jungle and by the time they got there, the army had actually captured the airfield they wanted to be for them. Now, after this, they actually were just repurposed as conventional units on the ground and did cleanup operations in the Dutch East Indies. In the end of 1942, the two units were merged just to be the one. So they became the Koska 1st Special Naval Landing Force again. And they did do more paratrooper uniting, but eventually the unit was just sent to Saipan and then fought there and was annihilated there as a regular infantry unit. In 1944, they began kind of a replacement for the paratroopers, which were raider units. These were called s Sentai. The one unit they first made was the Sasebo 101st Special Naval Landing Force. And this was actually made up of men from the Yokosuka 1st Special Naval Landing Force that left Saipan before the island fell. These units basically didn't follow any convention seen before. They were company-sized and very, very well-armed, with as many as half the men having Type 100 and Bergman submachine guns, which were considered a serious luxury to any other types of units at the time. Their plans were really ambitious. They wanted to send their men on an I-400 class submarine carrying a Type 4 Katsu amphibious landing craft to American islands and conduct raids. But with how strong the U.S. Navy was at this point, the plans never went anywhere. Another plan they came up with was to crash land their troops onto Saipan, kind of like the Giretsu Kuteitai in Okinawa. But again, this plan was delayed before it could ever actually see fruition. Um, so we've already kind of alluded to it, but um, obviously the SNLF, although most famous, were not the only type of naval landing force employed by the Navy. Uh, what were some examples of other naval landing forces? And was there a type of uh, naval landing force that you feel was like more influential or important than others, in your opinion? There's actually a ton of units. So probably the three ones I would say were the most common aside from Special Naval Landing Forces were Special Base Forces, Guard Units, and Air Defense Units. Special Base Forces were in charge of administration and defensive areas, and they were organized into several branches, including like construction, uh, seafaring, defense section, and they had a ground security branch, which basically served as a Naval Landing Force, and many were organized similarly or even identically to a Special Naval Landing Force. There was about 35 of these units raised from 1939 to 1945, and a lot of them saw action in the Pacific. Uh, some of the biggest battles they saw action in were Tarawa with the 3rd Special Base Force, the very infamous 31st Special Base Force in Manila, and the 22nd Special Base Force in Balikpapan during the very end of the war. Uh, second up would be guard units, which were probably accounted for the vast majority of naval infantry on the ground, I would say. Like special base forces, they're organized into several branches, but they didn't really have the administration duties. 
And they did have a ground security branch that served as a naval landing force. The organization of these units was very, very flexible because they were in so many different areas. You'd see some that were super heavily dug in, like, for instance, the Iwo Jima Guard unit, which had a ton of coastal defense guns and anti-aircraft guns. And then there was others like the 84th on Guadalcanal, which was basically just a special naval landing force company with mostly light infantry weapons. And there was about 90 of these units. So, yeah, about 90 units outside Japan and even more inside Japan. So based on the sheer number of loan, they saw the most combat. Air defense units were um, company-sized units with auto cannons, du- dual-purpose guns, or a mixture of the two. Many were armed with infantry weapons as well if they were in the front lines. So they were actually really similar to a special naval landing force company. They were so similar, in fact, that they could be combined into a combined special naval landing force and serve alongside of them. And there was 161 of these units created between 1942 and 44, almost all of them outside of Japan. But by the end of 44, they were merged into other neighboring units. So we don't really hear about them as much in combat, but they were there. They were just part of like a special base force or guard unit. So I guess I would say guard units overall would be the most important, but it really depends on the location and time because special naval landing forces existed pretty much for like four and a half decades, whereas these units only existed for like five years or so. Um, I guess to open a whole can of worms, can the term, quote, elite or at least well-trained be applied to the naval landing forces? Um, Some English language works I've read are quite dismissive of their capability, um, writing them off kind of in blanket statements as little more than poorly to adequately trained armed sailors. Um, Was this something that varied greatly between individual units or categories of naval landing forces? In general, the overall quality of naval landing forces, regardless of the unit type, was really low. They relied almost entirely on reservists and conscripts to fill their ranks. But some of the unit commanders were very well seasoned. You had men that had served in Shanghai in the early 1920s, all the way up through the Sino-Japanese War. So by the time World War II broke out, they really knew what they were doing and they could make the best out of the relatively low-grade troops they had. Now, there are some exceptions, like the aforementioned paratrooper and raider units did have really well-trained men, as well as in the Shanghai Special Naval Landing Force. They did have a few battalions that were really well-trained since they existed so long. Overall, since naval landing forces by nature are just kind of temporarily raised in times of need, they didn't really have the luxury to have good training or really good troops within them. So thank you so much for this a fascinating talk. Um, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of people listening have. Um, if they want to know more, uh, now is your time to plug your stuff. <laughs> sure. So, of course, I've got my book, Rig Sentai, the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Japanese Lima Landing Forces. It's heavily illustrated with tons of period photographs, basically all using period Japanese sources that I've translated. So I think it probably gives the best insight over all the types of units and uh, the organization out of anything available. I also have my website, riksentai.net, where I post tons of archived photos that I'm gathering in Japan. And if people want to follow you on social media, what's your uh, English uh, Twitter? It's adachi underscore Austin underscore. (laughs) Still better than mine. Well, again, thank you very, very much. Um, And I hope everyone listening um, has enjoyed the talk and we'll see you next time. Bye. Great. Thank you so much.